Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium 2017 podcast. The Big Screen Symposium took place in Auckland on the 30th of September and 1st of October. Please note, while many of the speakers used clips in their sessions, we've edited these out to better suit the podcast. Leading distribution strategist Peter Broderick challenges filmmakers to think outside the box in this empowering session about feature film distribution in today's world. It's for independent films. Um, it's particularly grim in the United States for documentaries. Four or five years ago, lots of people were seeing documentaries in theaters. And now you can be in theaters, you just can't have audiences. That's the problem. <laughs> um, there was a film that I was consulting on and it opened in Los Angeles, got a rave review from the LA Times, played for a week. And over that week, the film averaged two people a screening all week. And that is not so exceptional. Um, so you just have to be really clear. If you want to do theatrical distribution, think about doing what I call limited theatrical distribution, which might be one week in New York. Um, and there's ways to do that um, without wasting a lot of resources um, on, on trying to get audiences around the country. Then there's semi-theatrical, and that's one-off special event screenings of films where somebody's paying you a rental fee, and often there's a, you, you're on a tour and you do a Q&A. That applies more to documentaries. Um, and there's educational sales, which for documentaries can be really, really significant now. And there's a whole new world of educational distribution, which if there's time in the Q&A, I can talk to you more about. Then there's television, um, uh, TVOD, which is iTunes, Amazon, SVOD, which is Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, there's direct digital, which is you're going to make the film available directly from your website digitally. Uh, there's <clears throat> um, retail DVD, uh, which is still there somewhat, and um, direct DVD, where you're making it available from your website. And so when you're thinking about your avenues, you need to think about the sequence and how long you're going to spend in each avenue. And if you have overall control of your distribution, if an avenue is going really well, you can stay in that avenue longer. And if it's not going well, you can go f faster to the next avenue. So on the international front, these are the avenues that are more relevant, um, you know, which all, are all avenues that you know about. But I would encourage you, when you're thinking about making deals with sales agents, to make sure that you retain the rights to sell from your website, uh, digitally and on DVD, after they've had their first crack at making territory by territory deals. So here's a spectrum from formulaic to um, customized. And the question is where you are on that spectrum when you're thinking about a distribution strategy. Here's formulaic, which is Twinkies in a factory. Um, here's customized. Um, so this is sort of you know, a snapshot of <laughs> from the early days of film to a situation where people are watching films more and more on their cell phones. And this slide, which is a kind of weird, I admit, but basically this is the problem with much traditional distribution, that the f distributors are always looking backwards. They're always looking for a film that's like a film they distributed before that was successful. They have a lot of trouble looking into the present um, and looking into the future is just too scary. Um, so when you're thinking about it, you really need to be thinking about how audiences are organized now. Um, you're not going to just be worried about comps, as in you know, how much did certain films do 10 years ago and how that applies to you, because things have changed so much. So here you are kind of at the crossroads thinking about your distribution strategy. So now I'm going to go back and sh show you a few examples of films um, from the kind of early days of what I call hybrid distribution. The first one is a feature film called Reversal. It's set in the world of high school wrestling, and I'll just show you a, a quick trailer. So when the filmmaker shot on 35 millimeter, and when he was finished, he started doing theatrical distribution in the US. And he was barely breaking even in terms of ticket sales versus his costs. So then he said, OK, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start selling this film out of my garage. And he was going to sell it on uh, uh, <laughs> DVD. He'd never done that before, but he knew there were core audiences out there. So 
high school wrestling, college wrestling, professional wrestling, I'm sorry, Olympic wrestling, not professional wrestling, different audience. And so he hired two interns, I think he paid them like $10 an hour, and they looked up all the wrestling websites and all the wrestling organizations that were relevant, and pretty soon they had a list of 400 and they started telling those organizations about the film. People in those organizations started watching the film, and then he started selling directly to them from his website. And over time, he sold 70,000 DVDs. Um, and in that situation where you're selling directly, you're not splitting the money with middlemen. Um, uh, money's actually coming to you on time. Um, and he did you know, phenomenally well just targeting that core audience. And of course, if a core audience likes your movie and you go to them directly, there's gonna be word of mouth within that core audience. So next I want to go to Napoleon Dynamite. How many of you have seen Napoleon Dynamite at some point? Okay, well, you won't mind seeing the trailer, I'm sure. Um, so situation, first feature at Sundance, Fox Searchlight buys the movie. They come back to Los Angeles and they, they're deciding what they do about the distribution. And they're going to pick one core audience to target. So as you're watching the trailer, I want you to think about what core audience they chose. Okay, so who do you think they chose as a target audience? Any, any suggestions, hands, ideas? Yes? Young teenage males. Okay, another, somebody else? College, university, we're getting warmer. Nerds, you got it. Okay, you get the prize. <laughs> So the idea was, um, their goal was to get every nerd in America to see the movie and memorize the dialogue. Uh, <laughs> and and three to seeing it three times was kind of what they had in mind. So uh, they s spread the word online. They did a couple test screenings to get the word of mouth going. The movie opens, and the nerds were all there the first weekend. They were back the next weekend. <laughs> They were there the third weekend, and the fourth weekend, the nerds were there, and their parents showed up. Um, and I think what's so great about this example is that if you have a core audience, and you can get them out the first weekend and the second weekend, keep the movie in theaters long enough, then the movie can cross over to more diverse you know, audiences, rather than trying to reach a general audience to start with um, without having you know, clarity about you know, the sort of key audiences in there. And a couple other examples. Um, my Big Fat Greek Wedding is a feature that um, obviously people thought in the US that Greek Americans were gonna be the core audience. And they showed up um, the first weekend. Um, and then the second weekend, something interesting happened. First generation immigrants from all over the world came to the movie and decided it was their story. Uh, Midge and I lived next to a, a family of Persian Jews, and we were over at their house, and they said, uh, have you seen My Big Fat Greek Wedding yet? And we said, no, and they said, well, it's our story. We've seen it three times. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, there's something I don't get about it. But it was, it was both specific and universal. And so people really you know, felt that the, the experience resonated with their families in lots of ways. Another example is Bend It Like Beckham. So another film distributed by Fox Searchlight. Soccer moms, soccer daughters, and an Indian audience. Um, they publicized the movie to those folks to begin with. They showed up in the first few weekends, kept the movie in theaters long enough, and then the audience kind of expanded from there. Um, I'm gonna show you one more example of core audience. So Tyler Perry, are some of you familiar with Tyler Perry? Okay, so here's a trailer from his second film. So there's Tyler. <clears throat> he was um, homeless, living in his car in DC. He decided that he was gonna, he wanted to do some plays. So he wrote a, um, wrote a play and put it on in a local church and nobody came. And then he said, okay, I'm gonna do it again. He wrote another play and more people came. And then eventually he started traveling his plays around the United States, a sort of black dinner theater circuit and did better and better. And then finally started doing films, and he was producing and starring, and then he was directing as well. Um, and then he just developed this incredible following. So his movies would open, and they'd be number one at the box office in the US, and you know, white Americans had no idea who he was. 
Um, but eventually now he's kind of built, built a media empire. He has his own studio in Atlanta. Uh, he's doing television, film, and, and books as well. So that's, again, building from a core audience that really connected with him and wanted to support him along the way. So just thinking about audience for a minute, the old world and the new world. So in the old world, generally, audience comes last. People work on a film for a long time, and then they say, OK, so what do we do now when they are getting to the end of it? Um, I'd like you to think about audience from the first moment that you dream up the idea for your new film. And there's a lot that you can be doing in testing that audience, reaching out to that audience along the way, um, even before you've, you've made the movie and, and certainly while you're in production. So you're going to learn from doing that. If you do crowdfunding, of course, it's going to help you have a clearer sense of your audience. And then the more you know about your audience, the better you are at building that audience before the film's done. I talked about some of these other things, uh, <clears throat> the middlemen and direct access to audiences. You know, in the old world of distribution, audiences were sort of pretty anonymous and unreachable. So let's say Alfred Hitchcock, worldwide reputation, a lot of people loved his films. His films would come out and people would come or not come, but he didn't have the names and email addresses of anybody in that audience. He had no way to reach them. He had a mystery magazine, so maybe the subscribers to his mystery magazine. But now you can have the names and email of addresses of people that are in your audience, and there's an enormous amount to learn from them. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Hollywood studios still have um, de <clears throat> defined audiences in quadrants. Quadrants are older males, younger males, older females, younger females. It's such a pathetic definition of audience that I would be embarrassed if it was mine. And I, but the fact they're still doing it is kind of amazing. And it, it goes to the thing I was talking before about looking backward. The way I think you should think about audience is how people are organized online. Because there's almost every set of folks is online somewhere in some configuration. It could be Facebook, Facebook it could be websites, it could be organizational. Um, places, networks, um, and that's a way that you can reach people directly uh, by going to them online. A lot of the advertising these days is, you know, traditional advertising, newspaper advertising is pretty much, you know, throwing your money down a rat hole, whereas using social media in an effective and targeted way can be very, can work very well and, and be very affordable. So here's an example. This is a documentary about the making of a Steinway piano. And I asked the filmmaker, who I worked with him in a long time, that his distribution was very successful, to make a chart of the ecosystem of his audiences. Now, this was after he'd been in distribution for a while. And some of this is obvious, you know, Steinway dealers and Steinway owners, piano students and their parents. My favorite one is um, piano technicians, which is, you know, on the left, the second one down. Piano technicians are piano tuners. So he figured out that there was an organization of piano tuners, and he went to their national convention, and he showed the movie to 750 piano tuners, and they've been telling people whose pianos they tune about the movie ever since. So that's going directly to an audience. Um, it's not advertising, showing it to people at the center of that audience, and if they like it, counting on the kind of word of mouth that that will generate. Here's another example. This is a film about organic meat raising. And I asked him to make a map of his audience in this. He added colors, he added shapes, he added sizes. And then the, this would change as he went forward. So he had a continual sense, a, a, you know, a better understanding of who his audiences were as he went along. Uh, and that, that was really crucial. OK, this is a film called Good Dick, which um, premiered at uh, the Toronto Film Festival, and they decided not to take a traditional distribution route. So let me show you the trailer. So the film actually premiered at Sundance. Um, the filmmakers had, the producers had made a couple films before and made traditional deals, which they were super unhappy with the results of. So in this case, they decided they're gonna split up the rights. Um, they did a service deal where they hired someone to put it in theaters initially. They, I think they opened in six cities in the United States got really good reviews, built some awareness, and then they split up their other rights. So they made a deal with their, for their digital rights. Um, they kept the right to sell from their website. They did screenings around the country on campuses. Um, 
and really worked it. Um, and even though there was not a simple core audience for this film, as you can see, uh, they really connected with younger audiences and, and ended up um, doing much better than they would have done in a traditional deal. And the filmmaker said, and she wants to be able to, you know, when she, she wants to be able to give the rights of the film to her, her granddaughter someday. Um, so it was so important for her to keep those rights. And they did it um, uh, very, very successfully. Now, this next one is a weird example, um, but it's an example of crowdsourcing uh, for production and distribution. So we start out in Finland. Five Finnish nerds uh, decide they want to make a Star Trek parody. The problem is they don't have any money, and they've never made a film before. But they didn't let those things stop them. Um, <clears throat> so they went online, um, and there was a lot of interest in helping out. So they found actors, m musicians, and special effects people. And eventually, they were able to make this feature. I'm going to show you the trailer, and I'll tell you what happened then. So the, the budget was about 20,000 euros, uh, which if you know, Hollywood had made that movie would have, uh, I can't tell you what the multiple would have been in terms of the budget. Um, they made the movie available free online. Uh, and then they sold lots of uh, related items, uh, from DVDs to T-shirts to whatever. They made a, a, a multiple of their budget back in, in terms of revenue. Um, they eventually had about 3,000 people contribute in some way to the making of the movie. And the filmmaker at one point said to me, the best way to have people promote the movie is if they're involved with it and they want to tell other people about it. Um, and then they went on to make, uh, the next feature was about Nazis on the moon coming back to the US, to the world. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's a way to think about how you can crowdsource um, creatively, uh, because almost all the special effects in the movie were contributed by people around the world that they never even met. Okay, so just a couple quick slides. Um, thinking about having a website and People come to you, come to the website for the first time. They're visitors. You know, I'd like you to figure out a way to make them encourage them to be subscribers to your mailing list. Ultimately, a customer. They're going to buy something, and then finally, a patron of you, or a, a mentor supporting you throughout your career. Um, I'm going to just whip through the next few slides, but this is an example of what I call hybrid theatrical distribution, where. A film can open in play week-long runs in some theaters and one-night runs in other theaters. So um, Pearl Jam 20, which was about the 20th reunion, uh, used this model. Um, then these documentaries did as well. And then when this documentary on the Beatles opened, it was available on Hulu at the same time as it was in theaters. But a lot of people wanted to see it together in a theater on a big screen. So it made almost $3 million, even though it was available digitally at the same time. So this is the old way of thinking, sequentially, production and distribution. But this is the way I think you should be thinking, that they're running in parallel through the whole process. Um, and how you, what you're doing related to distribution could be just testing audiences, could be putting a tra tra trailer out there that's going to roam around virally. <laughs> So here are a couple slides about you know, the things that I think are really important. So the first one is controlling your distribution. Um, and then we've talked about, I've talked about designing a customized strategy, prioritizing your goals. Um, each of these steps are important. Um, then sometimes people finish their movie, a lot of times filmmakers finish their movie, they've spent every cent they can on post and they have no money for distribution. And in my experience, if you're going to take this kind of approach, you need some money to cash flow your distribution. And if you have no money, then your options are going to be very much limited. Now, it might be $25,000, it might be $10,000, it might be $50,000. But without that, without being able to hire some people to put together a distribution team that can help you, um, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, now, when, I t when you make a movie, you're, you're, you have a production team. And I think when you distribute a movie, you need a distribution team. So who are those people, and what, what th do they need to do? You're the general of the team, um, but there's people with expertise that can help you. 
So for example, if you were gonna do single special event screenings around the country, uh, there's somebody that can help you push the movie out. If you wanted to be in a limited number of theaters, there's film bookers that you can work with. If you wanted to partner with organizations, there's people that can do, help you do outreach to organizations. Um, if you're talking about publicity, uh, there's people that can do traditional film press, which is really critics. There's people that can do what I call off the entertainment press, which is getting stories in publications, you know, by an environmental reporter or a health reporter or, you know, a crime reporter, whatever uh, subjects are related to your film. And then there's people who are really good at social media, as you may have already noticed. 95% of the people who say they're good at social media are not. Um, so you really want to find someone who's good at it. And if you find people that are, it can make a huge difference. So then this is, you know, just talking about core audiences. Um, um, the idea of building around an audience around your film and how to do that. The concept of win-win partnerships, which I think should be how you think about working with not just with distributors, but with pretty much anybody, organizations. You want the partner to do really well. Um, it isn't like there's a zero-sum game or you're dividing up a pie. Uh, there's a way to work it so that you know, both of you really benefit and you hopefully will have a chance to work together again. This is about implementing your strategy step by step. Um, and then these are the kind of words I encourage you to think about. <laughs> Being proactive instead of reactive. Being as creative as possible in your distribution, just like you were in making your film. Uh, being nimble, it's, you know, it's a, a, a tight team of, of uh, independent filmmakers can take information in and, and change their strategy as they go. Whereas a lumbering studio, pretty much once the, once the distribution begins, they can't change anything. Their idea is the horse has left the barn, it's too late. Um, and being tenacious is absolutely um, crucial. And then, you know, ultimately, um, I'd like you to be able to take your audience with you to the next films you make. So here's some slides about the ways that having an audience can increase your independence. Now, um, you know about crowdfunding, and if you want to talk about it a little bit in the q and I'm happy to do that. But the, for me, the key thing about crowdfunding is not the money you raise, but the awareness you build and the network of support you create. And if you can do those things well, um, you know, you'll raise some money as well, but that's, that's the third most important goal. <laughs> okay, so in terms of revenues, again, this is your audience. So you can be making money from screenings, you can do pre-sales, you can do direct sales on your website, and you can do retail sales. Now, this is another thing that's important. If you have an audience that's you know, supportive of your work, um, they can share teasers or trailers with other people. They can post about it, blog about it here and there, uh, and they can do reviews and ratings and reviews on IMDb, uh, you know, on Netflix, on Amazon. Those reviews mean a lot. So when I see a film, film that comes out and the filmmaker has two reviews on Amazon, I'm like, what, you don't have any friends? I mean, come on, you, you need to get some, some reviews out there and um, it isn't that you want people to lie about your movie, but find the people that are enthusiastic about it and encourage them to write about it. Um, okay, so with crowdsourcing, these are the kinds of things you can get. Um, some films have gotten, um, you know, a lot of ideas that they've, some filmmakers have gotten a lot of ideas and think help with segments, crew, music, content, and translations. This is interesting. Um, there's a film um, called Indie Game the Movie, which is about independent video games. It's available directly from the filmmaker's website in 25 languages. All of those languages have been crowdsourced. So people in different countries contributed the translations for free. And that's something that I'm, I'm seeing more and more. And so maybe it's not a perfect translation, but it's, it's a translation that's, that's good enough that, that people are satisfied with it. So there's a lot of, a lot of help out there. And then the feedback uh, is, is here is, you know, you can show people teasers and trailers you're thinking of using and, and see how they respond. You can show them scenes. You can, you know, sh 
have them listen to music and look at your poster. And that feedback can be very, very useful. Sometimes you can screen the whole a rough cut you know, for a limited number of fans and see, see what they have to say. It's sort of a virtual um, test screening. Um, and then they can also um, provide connections, maybe where there's more resources, um, uh, mailing lists, um, things like that. So the, the, the idea of having, even if it's a couple hundred people that are out there supporting your film, um, it can make, and psychologically, obviously, it can make a huge difference as well. Um, and these are the other kinds of resources that people can contribute. Um, so now I'm going to talk quickly about two filmmakers I mentioned briefly in the um, keynote uh, based in Australia. And this is uh, their website, foodmatters.tv. Um, their first film, uh, Food Matters, did really, really well. And I'm going to show you a trailer, and I think you'll get a sense from the trailer how how important a trailer can be. So here are the filmmakers, the two healthiest people I've ever met. <laughs> and they started at zero. They did, hadn't gone to film school. They started, as I mentioned in the keynote, uh, to try to help their, the dad get better. Um, and they made this uh, out of passion and, and commitment, really, not out of some kind of commercial impulse. Um, and that trailer um, has been so effective for them that it's not just helped them sell the movie and sell it directly as they've done. Um, I think they've, as I mentioned yesterday, I think they've sold like 350,000 DVDs from their website or from other websites. Um, but it you know, gave them a mailing list that is strong and supportive and um, they're in touch with once a week of over a million people. Um, then they made this film, Hungry for Change, which I mentioned they made available for free for uh, 10 days. And 450,000 people, people around the world in 105 countries watched the movie um, and then bought DVDs and recipe books to the tune of over a million dollars. Then they decided, well, they wanted to set up a health and wellness, kind of a Netflix for health and wellness films called Food Matters TV. And let me just show you a quick trailer. So one of the things that is so great about these filmmakers is that they're always trying new things. So Food Matters TV, they just started. They didn't you know, raise money uh, from investors. And now, the last I heard, they had over 30,000 people around the world paying between $7.99 and $9.99 a month to have access to the film library. And they're putting, adding new films to it all the time. <laughs> Um, so they try things, and if they don't work, they learn from them. And if they try other things and they work, they learn from them. Um, so they're constantly um, experimenting and learning. And if you visit their website, which is an exemplary website in terms of a website that's personal and effective, you'll, you'll see um, the two, the, the couple was everywhere, and now they have a child, and the ch it's the couple and the child that are everywhere. And you can feel the passion that they have for helping people, um, and it's, it's contagious. So here's the last slide. Um, the truly independent filmmaker who's working with distribution partners and selling directly, and hopefully she's living happily ever after. So we have lots of, times for, lots of time for questions. Here we all are. There's a question. There's a whole kind of complex issue about opportunity cost. Um, every time you're out there selling the movie you made last, you're not developing or making the movie you want to make next. And so do you have any suggestions on how to find the proper balance of that? Well, I think that if sustainability is important to you, um, then the things that you're doing in each stage with one film are going to cumulatively help you with that film. So instead of going quickly through distribution, like finishing a film and putting it out on all platforms simultaneously, if you're going stage by stage and you're learning things in each stage, then you can, you can make the strategy as effective as possible. So I think going slow there makes sense. But I think that the idea of working on one film on another film, but I think you also have to be thinking about who your audience is, can you, can you build a personal audience, and can you take them with you? 
Now, sometimes people say to me, well, you've made an environmental film, there's an audience for that film, they're not going to be interested in a film on autism, or they're not going to be interested in a film on, I don't know, um, Cary Grant. Um, <clears throat> but I think that that's wrong. If you understand how these people are building audiences where it's personal, so they're in, they want to support this filmmaker who's passionately making movies as she or he goes forward in their career. Uh, there's kind of a patronage, mentorship mentality. And I think crowdfunding ex exemplifies that in a way um, because you're connecting with a person. It's not like you're buying a product or you're, you know, you're doing an investment. So I, I think the, the balance thing is hard because you have limited resources and you have limited time. But the other part of it is, I think it's very important to think in terms of uh, working in a, as a team because so many people suffer from the I have to do it all myself mentality. And I'm not a therapist, but I mean, that's really a bad way to look at things in this, in this world. And so a lot of times um, I'm talking to folks, well, just get somebody who can help you 10 hours a week. And they're like, well, where would I find them? And I say, well, there's this thing called the internet and you can like post things there. And you have friends and you can go to your friends and say, and this is in my case, I have a teammate, um, and when I started having a teammate, um, I would post something online, and I'd get like 500 people who wanted to work with me half time. And so, what I've done recently, I've talked to 10 friends and said, "If you know a superwoman <laughs> who's looking for a part-time job, can you recommend her?" And so, last time I got 10 recommendations. And five of them were just so fantastic, I could have worked with any of them. And then I chose the woman who was even most amazing, and she's changed everything. So when you think about it, it's not just, and, and you're, we're paying these people. I'm not saying they should work for you as interns or, or volunteers. But if you want, if somebody wants to get into this crazy thing, I wouldn't call it a business, I call it film anarchy, um, then if they work with you, um, and they do a good job, they can learn a lot, and then you can be a mentor for them, recommending them to other people. So there aren't many rational ways in. This is a way that that's, that is. So you pay them, you know, they get experience, and then they have opportunities that flow from that. I think it's a good deal. Um, and I, originally, I thought that the best people were looking for full-time work, wrong. The best people were looking for part-time work because they're writing a novel, making a film, raising a child, writing an opera, whatever, but they've got 20 awesome hours for you. So I think there's fantastic people out there, and if you have a, gener a kind of generous spirit about how it's, you're gonna really mean to help them and not just you know, employ them, then I think they can be you know, part of your team, and they're gonna go on to great things, so you only have so long <laughs> to work with them. But I think I, I, I've been very lucky, and I think there's a lot of other people out there who would like those opportunities to work with other people. And then if they can do things for you that free you up to do the things you can uniquely do, then you have more time. So it's, it's just try to, you know, try to have that team where ex people have expertise you tap into, they do certain things, and you supervise or you know, connect with them. So I, th I think there's a lot of possibilities there. But it is good to be mindful about, you know, there's a lot of things you can do that are urgent but not important as opposed to things that are urgent, but uh, not urgent but really important that'll challenge. But it's a good question, so way, way in the back. Um, the collaborative distribution, what's an effective strategy when someone illegally uploads your film? Okay, well, um, it depends on where it is, but if it's on YouTube, it's a pretty straightforward way to get it taken down, and then it can like pop up again, and then you kind of get it taken down again. I, I would say in general, in your top 20 problems as an independent filmmaker, piracy is not on the list. Obscurity is right near the top. And <laughs> I would worry more about obscurity. In some cases, you're starting out and a little bit of piracy and more people know that you're a good filmmaker might, actually might even work for you. So I think the piracy is much more of a problem with studio movies, um, with big stars and franchises and things like that. And there's some, gonna be some piracy that's just you know, kind of part of the land. But I occasionally hear examples of piracy where it really hurt a film, 
But I've worked with over, I don't know, say 1,500 filmmakers and 1,300 movies. And very, very rarely has there been an instance where the piracy has been damaging to them in a career way, as opposed to maybe on one film they didn't get as many revenues as they could. So I think it's, I think it's workable. Hi. Uh, Peter, I've um, paid to watch a few movies on YouTube and the experience has been amazing. Why aren't they a bigger player? And do you think they will be soon? Uh, YouTube? Well, YouTube has got a new platform called YouTube Red. Is it in, is it in uh, New Zealand? And it's, it's what's interesting about that is that um, now we're getting into questions of global distribution as opposed to territory by territory. YouTube Red's still only in, I don't know, maybe four territories. Um, but then they can make it available through Google Play and other ones in other countries. So with Keddy, the movie about cats in Istanbul, um, YouTube Red actually noticed that 84 million people were watching cat videos. So they made a deal because um, it was a sure thing where all these other distributors just couldn't get it. Um, so it really worked for the filmmakers and, and you know, really helped YouTube Red. So I think YouTube Red is trying to increase the quality of the things that it makes available. Um, but uh, they're definitely focused on specific audiences online, younger audiences, I think, in particular. So I could just give a quick overview of what's going on with Netflix and Amazon and Hulu. Um, so as you know, and I know Netflix in New Zealand and Australia is different than Netflix in the US, and I've heard about people getting IP addresses in the US so they can have Netflix from the US. Um, but uh, Netflix is acquiring many, very few docs these days, and indie features, I think, as well. I think they're really focusing on original content. So it's harder and harder uh, to make a Netflix deal, particularly a, a world Netflix deal, but they're, they're still doing it. Um, Amazon is doing more and more, uh, and they're gonna be moving, they wanna be much more global than they are. I think they're maybe in four or five countries right now. And in their model, um, if they finance a movie, a feature, then they, there's a three month window where the movie's in theaters. And then after that, it's available on Amazon Prime. Um, Netflix is not, will give you a window, but not that excited about doing it, where Amazon thinks that's an important part of what they do. Hulu is shifting. Um, Handmaid's Tale, has that been available here? Um, has sort of elevated their game <laughs> um, pretty, pretty much. And so um, they're gonna be acquiring more. Uh, it's a little unclear exactly what the mix is, but definitely um, some documentaries. Um, and then there's, you know, the, it's changing so fast. I feel like it's changing every 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, if it, was, if it was true six months ago, it may not be true anymore. And you just have to stay kind of in the loop or have people who are, you know, um, collaborators in some way or advisors who are on the, you know, cutting edge, you know, kind of tell you the latest. Um, another question over there. Okay, <laughs> so I'll just do a haiku thing on negotiating. Um, <laughs> the first thing is you don't really want to negotiate for yourself because the person that you're negotiating with has probably negotiated 100 deals or more. Um, so to get somebody who's, who's knowledgeable to help you is really useful, but then you need to be really careful about who that person is because there are a lot of people who say they can do that job, but they're you know, five years behind the times and they're not even that good at it. So due diligence is super important in terms of finding someone to help you. Um, these days, a lot of times advances for distribution have gotten lower and, and people are making um, deals where there's no advance, um, but you're getting a split of revenues from the beginning. So, um, What's an example of that? So you could say um, th they're going to take the movie and then they're going to give you 20% of the revenues from the beginning. So that's like a, a, a gross corridor deal. 
And then at some point, they'll recoup their expenses and blah, 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 and then you'll split the revenues after that, and the split could be 50-50 or 75-25. Um, often when you're getting advances on distribution, the way sales agents think about it is they'll take an advance on distribution knowing that they're gonna never see a back end and they just their focus is on advances. Um, often when I'm talking to people about deals, they'll say, okay, this is the offer, we'll pay you this advance and this split. And I'll say, well, what if you don't pay us an advance, what would the split be? And they're always shocked that you know I would pass up an advance, but the advance is a token advance anyway, so I'd rather a, a, a good split, assuming the company's honest company's not honest, the split doesn't really matter because you're never going to get any money. Um, often there's a situation where you have one offer and it's very common to have a kind of bird in the hand mentality. If I don't take this offer, I'll never get another offer. What I would say is that no deal is better than a bad deal. You're always going to regret a bad deal. Um, and I think what I would encourage you to do is have an internal bottom line so you say, okay, I'm not gonna make this deal unless I get A. You don't tell the other side, but they'll hear it in your voice that you're gonna walk away if, if the deal is, is unfair. And that gives you leverage in the deal. You know, what often happens is they'll say, well, we'll send you a boilerplate contract and then we, we can negotiate from there. Translate that, it, we'll send you the worst contract we can possibly dream up and then we'll negotiate it to make it less terrible. But what about starting with a fair contract and negotiating from that framework? So sometimes there's a way to do it where you're talking with a potential distributor and you say, okay, these are the rights that you know, we're keeping or we, we're working with other people on, these are the rights that we have available, are you interested? And if they don't run screaming from the phone, um, then they're kind of agreeing to take limited rights. So it's, you can often create the framework of a deal and see if they'll stay on the, in the conversation as opposed to negotiating off a terrible contract, not knowing if you can ever get to a fair deal. So um, th those are just some, some thoughts. And, and um, what I like about a gross corridor deal, it's a situation where instead of other contracts where you could be getting no money for years and years and years, although the distributor's receiving money, um, you're getting money along the way. Um, and I, you know, I much prefer that model. <laughs> um, okay, so just a word about um, honesty. Uh, Hollywood accounting, however bad you think it is, it's worse. And so think of it this way, you're a, you're a major studio and you can either write a contract so that the, that'll be a legal contract and then follow that contract to the letter of the law and the filmmaker will never get any money. That's one approach. Another approach is you write a contract that seems, you know, pretty good and you just don't report accurately. And then if you ever get audited, you, um, you pay what, was, what you should have paid, but the people that don't audit you just, they lose out. So it's a pretty tough situation and you really need to be clear with due diligence talking to other filmmakers about how they did in terms of getting paid and what their experience has been. And if you don't do dil due diligence, which is talking to you know, three to five filmmakers who worked or are, have worked or are working with a distributor before you make a deal, then there's no way to protect you because you're just you know, taking, listening to their siren song and signing on the dotted line. Another question? Up there. Yeah, um, very, very few New Zealand films would ever have an association with a major Hollywood studio. Okay. Most of the distributors, these guys would be working with are independents. Right. Can you talk about some of the independent distributors in the US who are doing good things like A24 or The Orchard rather than the impression that all distributors have forms no, no, I, that's, I, I, that's a great question. And there are, there are very good distributors in the US and, and in other, every country, I'm sure. I'm not about every country, but there are good distributors. But I think that it's important to understand that you're better off if you make a distribution strategy first and then find a distributor that can help you implement your strategy in terms of, instead of fitting into their one size fits all strategy. So yes, Orchard, A24, you know, Fox Searchlight, um, Magnolia, 
um, Sony Classics. I mean, they can all, all be good, but you need to be careful um, because sometimes, I won't say which one of those is scared of the internet, but maybe more than one. But so they won't let you ever sell directly from your website, whereas other distributors will. And other distributors don't see this as undercutting them, but actually incentivizing you to promote your movie more, which is going to help them in retail as well as you know, help you in direct sales. So there are good foreign sales agents and there are good distributors for sure. Um, but the challenge is sometimes it's not that they're not good, it's just that they're, they're stuck in an old model and they don't, they're not nimble enough, they're not customized enough that they can really maximize the, you know, the thing for your movie. So with Caddy, was, what was interesting was the uh, oscilloscope was very collaborative with the filmmakers. So the filmmakers had made a trailer to raise money to make the movie and they raised all their money to do that. And then they gave that, then they worked on that trailer with oscilloscope to modify it a little bit for theatrical distribution. They worked on the poster together um, the filmmakers did a great job, you know, with Q and A's. Um, and, you know, in that situation, the oscilloscope knew the filmmakers had expertise about core, the core audiences that they could tap into. You know, in some models, the distributors think they know all, everything there is to know, and they don't really want to hear from the filmmakers. And if the filmmakers are making a movie out of passion, you know, connecting with audiences that they live in, um, th that's, a, that's a mistake, not to be collaborative. So I think you want someone who's honest, effective, and collaborative. And then if you give them limited rights, this is the other thing. So there's all rights, and then there's some rights. So if, if you think about it, most distributors are good at some things, mediocre at others, and positively awful at others. So you don't want to give them the rights they're awful at, and I'd prefer you didn't give them the rights that you, they were mediocre at either. You want to give them the rights they're good at. And they can, a lot of times they can understand that. And, you know, it's easy for them to take all your rights and not do something with some of the rights. But you say, well, we're going to keep our educational rights or we're going to keep these rights. And they go, okay, well, okay, if you insist. And you know perfectly well they don't really care about those rights in the first place. So I think it's being creative in the deal making as well as the distribution, as well as the production. But that's a good point, and I hope I didn't give the impression that all distributors were evil. I, there's some areas, what foreign sales, you absolutely need to work with a foreign sales agent. There's no question about that. Now, the fact that a lot of them are lame and headed for extinction, I, you know, I can't, you know. But there are good ones, and the ones that are kind of looking forward. Um, you can't do educational distribution without an educational distributor. Um, there's other things you can do, um, but you need to understand where you need help and find the best people to help you. And a lot of times, you know, they respect people that have a clear idea of what's going on with distribution. It's not like, it used to be, okay, when the fight was over, how much is the advance and how much is the split? And these days, that's not the fight, usually. The fight is, you know, how is the movie going to come into the world how is it going to be supported? How is it going to be marketed? How can we work together? So another question? Yeah. Could you please talk about how crowdsourcing works and what are the right strategies to crowdsourcing? Crowdsourcing or crowdfunding? Oh, sorry. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't know. Are there specific crowdfunding uh, folks in this, companies in New Zealand? Yeah. yeah. And how satisfied have you been with those? Very. Very? And so um, what, what kind of amounts of money are people raising for a film? What's the range? The highest ever is 125 grand. Uh, usually it's a year of your 10 to 30 grand. What about Mahana? Well, Mahana did 200 on an equity crowdfunding, uh, but the um, classical crowdfunding was 125%. Okay. And then... Um, are those for fiction films more or for both fiction and docs? Documentaries. No, and fiction. And fiction? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I can just say, you know, a couple words about Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, and uh, in the New Zealand model, do you get what you raise or do you not get anything if you don't make your goal? No, but I meant the, the New Zealand companies. All or nothing, mostly? Okay. 
Well, I think all or nothing is a good model. Um, in my experience, um, if, if you're getting close to your goal, um, it, it, it's a big incentive for people to get you over the hump. Um, some filmmakers are very conservative and they just, well, I'll, I'll just take whatever I raise and because I'm not sure I can make my goal. Well, then I would say two things. You should make your goal lower. <laughs> and secondly, you should, you should get a Dutch uncle. So the way the Dutch uncle theory works, you may all know this, but basically you have somebody who says if you're within, I don't know, $10,000 of your goal, they'll put that money in and then you, you can repay them from the money that you receive. So that's essentially a loan minus whatever the percentage is that the, you know, the crowdfunding company takes. And so that if you're smart about your goals, then you shouldn't be in a situation where you're in, in big jeopardy as to whether you're gonna make your goal. And um, maybe there's a Dutch aunt you could have, a Dutch uncle, but I think that can really make a big difference. Some more questions? Peter, one last quick question. One last quick question. Yeah. Okay, make it quick. Jackie's lo Jack is watching you. Okay. <laughs> so most of us here are using your term yesterday, dependent filmmakers. And as part of the funding that we can access here, we have to put in a distribution plan and have a distributor attached. So in terms of doing limited deals with Dan, it's not one to coordinate the film. Well, that's complicated. I mean, I think one of the things that you can do, um, I mean, in the old model, people were always doing comps. They'd say, you know, Napoleon Dynamite, this, Dynamite made this much money, you know, 10 years ago, blah, blah, blah. I think comps are largely a complete waste of time and, and not useful. Um, what I would rather you do is give them a distribution strategy um, that shows how you're go who your core audiences are you know, how you're gonna reach them, um, and maybe gives a range of what the rights are worth, different rights are worth in the market today in different situations, rather than saying, you know, there's a Guinness Book of Records example that I can cite. And if you do that, in my experience, if you have a sophisticated distribution strategy, it's, it's impressive to funders and it's impressive to um, distributors. Uh, and most of the people don't have the, a good strategy, and um, and so if you do, you you kind of stand out. So I think that's important. You know, one of the problems I think with some of the funding models is that there's there's rules and regulations that might have been right worked ten years ago, but there's a kind of inertia where those regulations are still hanging around. I know in Australia, to get you know a support, um, you needed to have a foreign sales company on board. And if that foreign comp sales company is, you know, totally behind the times and, you know, hanging by a thread, it's still, you needed an albatross around your neck to be possibly getting funding. But I've heard of examples like that sugar film, for example, in Australia had, has loosened up the requirements because they didn't have that. And the film was, you know, enormously successful. There's a company in Australia, some of you might've heard of called Fanforce and they do crowds, crowdsourced theatrical and special event screenings. I've been very impressed by what they've done. Maybe they do, do they work in New Zealand too, or just, yeah? So um, I've been very impressed by them. So I think that, you know, you might have some of those folks on board, not just, you know, tr you know traditional distributors. And then I think you have to make the case uh, that your film has this specific potential in this moment in time um, and I think a, a lot people can hopefully, you know, be open to that because eventually these things are going to change. So you want to be an exception because, you know, and another thing, when I talk to distributors and they say, um, we've never done that before, I'm like, great. This is a chance for you to do it, to try it. And if it works, you're going to do it a lot more. And if it doesn't work, well, you tried it. It's hard to answer that question because they, as things are changing around them, if they're not trying things, then their days are numbered, that's for sure. So if you do that in a kind of positive, constructive way, they can see it as an opportunity, not just 
for how your film will do, but what they'll learn and how that's going to help them going forward. So when you think about what Netflix has done, changing from a DVD model to a digital model, you know, they took a big risk um, and, modif you know, learned as they went, and now they're Netflix <laughs> around the world. I should say, actually, there's another theatrical um, demand platform in New Zealand and Australia called Demand Pearl. Um, which I represent in New Zealand, um, and we've also gone out to eight other countries, uh -huh. including the US, Ireland, uh, UK, Germany. So there's another option. Great. Again, Great. For international distribution. Yeah. But I would, I, I would just say one thing about crowdsourced theatrical. <clears throat> in the United States, um, there's, there's Tug and Gather have been doing it the most. Um, but I'm not super excited about it in the US. I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know about it you know, here. But the thing is that if you can do screenings that aren't, you know, 75 people have to buy a ticket in advance to you know, tip the screening, but there's an organization that's going to pay a rental fee. So you're, there's a certainty that the screening is going to happen. Um, I would rather you not be in a movie theater. I'd rather you be outside a movie theater. Because in a movie theater in the States, now I'm not saying in New Zealand or Australia, but you know, you have a two-hour block. Yeah. Um, you've got 15 minutes to do a Q&A. Often they can't find the mic, in the mic in the theater, and they can't get the light on the people in the front of the theater. I'm like, well, if you could be on a campus, a museum, a library, they've got the right AV, you can have the whole night. Yeah, so, that yeah, so that, those events, I'd always choose to have the whole night, people gather in the front, show the movie, Q&A, and then gather some more. And now Jackie's pulling me out of here. So wait, wait, wait. So I just want to say thank you uh, very much. And I really do think that you have f exciting opportunities now that haven't been there for filmmakers before. So um, I wish you all good luck. And if along the way I, I can be of help, you can definitely um, send me an email. I have business cards with giraffes on them. So if you like giraffes, I'll give you a giraffe. Thanks. This session is presented by Loading Docs. The Big Screen Symposium is brought to you by Script to Screen and j &A Productions. We would like to thank our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, Images and Sound, Auckland Tourism Events and Economic Development, and Stage and Screen Travel Services. VoiceOver is provided by Samantha Dukes and music by Poddington Beer.